Thank you very much, Admiral Carter. And let me tell you what a pleasure it is to be back here. Uh, uh, by the way, this used to be called the Blue Bedroom, but uh, I guess you changed the uh, color scheme. And uh, those of you who've been dragooned into coming tonight, uh, you know, as we used to say about the reading in S&P, it's only a lot if you actually do it. So uh, <laughs> in terms of my remarks, they're only going to be tough if you actually listen to them. So, uh, <laughs> But uh, it, is, uh, it is really such a pleasure to come back here. I mean, the extraordinary views looking out there at the... Uh, at the uh, Newport Bridge, which has that you know beautiful sort of shape to it, because uh, they were anticipating aircraft carriers coming under it a lot. Uh, I guess that changed at some point, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I mean, what a what a pleasure it is to to be back here. Uh, I've had the opportunity to see some of my uh, professors here, and um, you know, people often ask me, you know, what was your most interesting uh, assignment that you had in the Foreign Service was it, uh, you know, running around with uh, Balkan warlords. I kind of like Balkan warlords, but that's another subject. Uh, but uh, really, coming here in, in 93, 94, and uh, having the opportunity to work in studies shoulder to shoulder with our with my military colleagues, even though they would not give me the papers that their colleagues had done the previous year so they could help them with this year's papers. I mean, I had to ask State Department people for their papers from the previous year. But anyway, um, it was, uh, you know, in, in 1993, I mean, we were already, our country was already undergoing some of the post-Cold War trauma, uh, frankly. I mean, we already had the situation in Somalia. We already had our people going into harm's way in some very complex places. And so um, coming here and having the opportunity to really understand how the military viewed some of these issues, um, I think was for me really crucial to, frankly, the rest of my career, which began after the graduation. I gather you don't do it out there on the deck anymore. Um, although, yeah, it was out on this uh, cement deck here. And uh, as I recall, you know, you never know what's going to happen here in June. It might be a snowstorm. But in that day, it was uh, 94 degrees uh, weather. And I think several people collapsed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, certainly, I mean, after that day, and then to go forth and um, you know, work on these, on these issues confronting our country. And to do so, I think, with a very much of a renewed sense that this is, uh, uh, to coin a phrase, all hands on deck. Uh, this was a, a situation where I think uh, since that time, since the end of the Cold War, I think we saw more and more of the fact that uh, the State Department uh, uh, the various uh, service branches, we were all in these things together. Um, you know, it is not to say that uh, we all have to be doing the same things, but we sure do need to understand what each other is doing. And uh, to some extent, uh, part, of the, part of the challenge of all this is really to be able to stay in each other in our own lanes, but uh, also just to uh, make sure that we are really uh, uh, one team, one mission, uh, as I, uh, an expression that we've uh, heard a lot in the last uh, 20 years. So um, I felt that the foundation for me of, of working with our, our military and, and places like uh, Bosnia, uh, in Kosovo, um, working with, uh, with, especially with the Navy out in the Pacific, uh, and uh, working on you know, issues like North Korea, and then finally uh, coming back to, to Iraq. I felt that for me, what I, uh, you know, some of the things that really laid the foundation for me were indeed here at the Naval War College. Uh, I always remember one of my S&P uh, um, uh, seminars, S and P just seems to. I mean, you, you don't rem you don't forget those seminars. You may forget some of the reading, but uh, but I always remember there was a there was an army colonel there who did uh, logistics, and I was giving the usual State Department sort of hand waving about well, you know, we'll, we would we were doing some case study. I said, well, we'd figure that out, you know. And he said, no, you don't understand. We need to know, and. Uh, 
And I think for me, I always remember that line, we need to know. This was someone who was doing, uh, uh, he was in the skit, he was playing the uh, logistician, and he said, we need to know. Uh, and so strategy and things like that, you can kind of uh, explain away or kind of, uh, uh, you know, ad hoc it. But uh, I think in things like uh, what the military needs to do to execute their mission. I saw that very clearly at the War College. So it's a great opportunity for me. I understand the uh, State Department has really uh, ramped it up here. I think uh, there were three of us here at the time. And uh, one of the problems with being State Department here is you can't just uh, take the gentleman C because everyone's expecting you to be smart or something. So uh, we really did have to do the reading and write the papers from scratch and uh, uh, things like that. So uh, <laughs> do you see the reaction of those people on that? Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so what I thought I'd do is maybe talk about some of the uh, current uh, crises. You know, um, I always uh, uh, think back, you know, when I look at where our country is today, I always think back to, uh, you know, before Poland had these wonderful leaders like uh, Lech Wałęsa and, you know, the Pope for that matter, they had not so wonderful communist leaders back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, there was a uh, particularly annoying guy named Władysław Gumuka, and he was the party first secretary starting in about 1956. And one time, uh, Władysław Gumuka uh, stood up in front of a large uh, crowd in Krakow. He was known for very long speeches and not very successful metaphors. And, I, and uh, he got up and he said, you know, uh, comrades, just a few years ago, our nation, our fatherland, stood on the very edge of a deep abyss. And I am here to tell you, comrades, that today we have taken an important step forward. <laughs> uh, and so, when we, when we contemplate some of these issues, we do have to be careful not to take that important step forward, but perhaps even if not a step back, but we need to think about uh, what our country is confronting. And are these crises that we really need to uh, engage in unilaterally, that is in the sense that our national interests are so, are so uh, engaged, are these crises we need to work with others? But perhaps most importantly, are these crises that engage more than just one issue for us, but a broader issue? You know, looking back uh, today at, at Bosnia, I read um, so often that somehow Bosnia was a, uh, was a human rights situation, and that's why we finally intervened, because we could not stand aside while, while innocents were being, uh, were being killed. And uh, like a lot of statements like that, it is true, but only partially true. I think what made Bosnia so enduring, so difficult, uh, ultimately uh, hard to resolve, but ultimately one that we did solve it, that we did, were able to address it, was that it was not just human rights, as important as that is and must be to our country and its, uh, and its future. It was also that because of Bosnia, this Atlantic alliance that I think we are so committed to, and I think events of the last weeks or months uh, is more reason to be con uh, committed to that uh, Atlantic Alliance, that that uh, Atlantic Alliance was very much corroding because of Bosnia. We were in such a uh, um, uh, kind of out of sync with our European allies. Uh, we didn't really know what NATO was going to be after the Cold War. We didn't know, you know, is it, a, is it an alliance that deals with, uh, with a Soviet threat? Well, it's hard to continue to be an alliance that deals with a Soviet threat if there's no Soviet uh, Union anymore. So we had to, I think, look very carefully at what NATO really meant. And we could see that our inability to kind of speak the same language on a crisis like Bosnia was causing, I think, really frayed nerves uh, and a very kind of difficult, uh, difficult way forward with the Europeans. So I think really 
when we look at why we addressed Bosnia, why we got together uh, with the Europeans on Bosnia, it really was to address the corrosiveness that had uh, seeped into, that, uh, into the NATO alliance. And that was uh, certainly as important, if not more important, than the issue of, of human rights. So I think a crisis is a crisis when it engages not just one issue, but a broader uh, range of issues. And I think uh, people who now look at Bosnia and say, what were we doing? there uh, need to understand it was a lot more than what was going on on the ground, horrific as that was, and uh, as much as people felt that we needed to have a uh, uh, not only a policy but an action plan for dealing with that, we needed to engage in Bosnia because it did affect our core interests, namely our, our Atlantic uh, relations. So when I look at um, some of the crises uh, today, and uh, I don't mean to give an exhaustive list, but I, I, I will mention the top three, uh, and that is to me the, uh, the situation uh, uh, surrounding Crimea. I would not call the crisis having to do with Crimea. I mean, after all, most, most people couldn't have spelled Crimea uh, unless they uh, you know, looked at the Tennyson poem from oh, over 100 years ago. But uh, um, it's not about Crimea, it's about Russia. And uh, I think we need to think very hard about what, is, what that relationship means to us and what, that, uh, um, and what kind of future we can have with Russia. I think we also need to look very hard at the situation in Syria. There are those who feel that Syria is also a, uh, a hideous human rights problem, which it certainly is, but I submit to you it's a lot more and a lot more, da more dangerous than that. And finally, I think we need to look at some of these uh, the nuclear wannabes out there, Iran and, uh, and uh, the North Koreans. I mean, the North Koreans, they are a people only a mother can love, I tell you. Uh, uh, and so uh, we need to look very hard about how we're addressing these, not only the threats these two countries uh, confront, but also the friends, partners, and allies that we have in confronting those issues and to understand that these issues are beyond just the question of, uh, of uh, the behavior of Iran and North Korea, but uh, the, how we manage it with our, with our partners. I think um, Russia is especially a difficult proposition. You know, people often describe uh, Vladimir Putin as, a, uh, as some kind of uh, great uh, sort of Russian patriot, uh, Russian nationalist who's now uh, using Russian nationalism to further his aims. I submit to you that uh, he is not so much a Russian nationalist as he is a person who is really uh, committed to his own, uh, his own future. It reminds me a little about, uh, of uh, Milosevic. I don't want to draw too close an analogy between uh, Vladimir Putin and Slobodan Milosevic, but I never felt that in all those wars in uh, the Balkans that Milosevic was particularly dedicated to a greater Serbia. I think he was much more interested in a greater Milosevic, and uh, I think he used Serb nationalism in order to further that agenda. And I think we see a lot of that today with, uh, with Putin. And uh, the more you look at the symbols of this, uh, of this gentleman who came out of the Soviet era, came out of the KGB of the Soviet era, you know, the crosses that he wears, which are especially visible when he's not wearing a shirt, but that's another, uh, another subject. Uh, I think we can uh, see someone who's probably more dedicated to um, the Soviet Union than he is to uh, Mother Russia. And the problem with this is, uh, I think it's understood, especially among Russian nationalists, that he's not particularly dedicated to the cause of Russian nationalism. And we used to see this all the time with Milosevic because the people who really uh, believed in the notion that somehow Serbia had been uh, mistreated, oh, starting about 1389 and every year since, those people who are very much believing in this notion of uh, that Serbia had kind of uh, died as a, or been uh, held up as a, mar uh, as a martyr, also never believed in the idea that Milosevic was a Serb uh, uh, patriot, uh, nationalist. Therefore, there was always an effort to try to push him on these issues, and even when Milosevic had long since lost interest in some of these nationalist projects, he went along with them because he realized his own 
personal uh, uh, reputation depended on his getting out in front of them. In short, people who cynically use nationalism are rarely people who can stand up in front of nationalists and say, we've gone too far, we need to slow down, we need to manage this in a different way. Those are people who often get carried by the uh, by the uh, events of the day to be uh, and always to want to be out in front. So I think the danger really with uh, with Putin is not only what he did with uh, Crimea, but also what could possibly come in eastern uh, in eastern Ukraine. Um, anyone who's lived in Poland knows that uh, the Poles often say that a Russia without Ukraine is just Russia. A Russia with Ukraine is the Soviet Union. I think people, especially on that eastern flank of NATO, are very aware of uh, what, uh, what it could mean if you see a further dismemberment of, uh, of um, uh, Ukraine. Certainly, what has happened in Crimea, you know, I don't need to go over the history with all of you, but, uh, you know, Crimea, uh, it could be argued, is uh, kind of Russian territory. I mean, it's uh, the decision by Khrushchev to give it to Ukraine uh, on the anniversary of the 300th anniversary, uh, 300th uh, uh, year of Ukraine being uh, linked to Russia. Um, and then uh, Yeltsin's own interest in, uh, Boris Yeltsin's own interest in essentially dismembering the Soviet Union and making common cause with Ukrainian nationalists and essentially uh, uh, leaving Crimea in, in Ukraine. I mean, from, a, from the point of view of a Russian nationalist, this in and of itself is not enough to say for them that uh, uh, Crimea should be part of, of Ukraine. But I think uh, our country and many other countries have wisely taken the view that, first of all, uh, if you have a situation where a neighbor takes a part of, of another country and claims it as its own for historical reasons, you have a problem. And so I think uh, the, uh, the Western nations have been correct to try to increase the cost to Putin of uh, taking Crimea. The concern, of course, is it's not just about Crimea. It could well be about the dismemberment of, uh, of Ukraine. And of course, as this continues, and I hate to use chess metaphors when discussing Russia, but uh, there is a point in chess where things become forced moves. You simply have no choice. You have to move your knight this way or your rook that way. And so uh, I think we are getting into forced moves, but we can see the outcome of these forced moves, and they may not be good for Russia, but they may not be good for us either. Um, the idea, first of all, that we're gonna have sanctions against Russia, there is no other choice at this point. We have to have sanctions against Russia. The concern, though, that we should all feel is the fact that as we push forward with sanctions against Russia, we are dismantling the last 23 years in which we've tried to bring Russia into the family of Western nations. So it's very much, I think, of a loss on our side. Um, and to some extent, for someone like Putin, it mi might be precisely uh, what he, what he uh, wants to have. Not unlike the uh, children's book we all read about Br'er Rabbit being thrown in the briar patch. That's exactly where Br'er Rabbit wanted to be. And being thrown out into the cold is very much where Putin uh, may want Russia to be. So I think there are a lot of concerns about the policy choices that we have and frankly don't have a lot of choice uh, in, um, in putting forward. And I think sanctions is certainly uh, one of those. I hope that uh, as we manage this uh, very difficult uh, uh, issue with Russia, we'll do a couple of things. First of all, I think it's very important that for our Eastern neighbors, our Eastern NATO flank, that those countries really feel that NATO is utterly committed to them. Uh, I think if you're Polish, uh, what runs through your mind is 1939. In 1939, of course, Poland had a uh, treaty with France and, and the UK by which if uh, Poland was invaded or attacked by Germany, France and the UK would uh, declare war on Germany. 
Well, they dutifully did that in September 39. They declared war on Germany, but they did not attack Germany. They did not send any forces to help Poland resist uh, Germany. And in fact, they sat and did nothing. It became known by historians as the phony war, uh, the winter of 39 and 40. And then the war really didn't start again until uh, in that in Europe until uh, uh, Germany attacked uh, uh, attacked westward, including against France. So I think. Um, you know, the polls uh, can be under, understood to be a little concerned when people express uh, uh, support for them when they don't see the signs of that support. So I think it has been very important to see if we can sort of thicken our presence in Poland and maybe the Baltic states as well, make sure we're doing more exercises there, training, et cetera. I think we need to show that these countries that the decision to bring them into NATO was not just a decision to, uh, you know, somehow do something nice for them, but rather a decision that had real meaning for the uh, uh, for their security. So I'm kind of. Um, so I'm concerned that we make sure that we do um, things on the ground in, these, in this eastern flank of NATO to, uh, to reassure them and real things uh, on the ground. The second thing I think we need to be uh, concerned about is as much as uh, it is understandable, and I would argue uh, we have no choice but to kind of throw uh, Russia into the deep freeze, I think we do need to look for cooperation and multilateral uh, efforts. We are going to need Russia in Syria, and I'll get to Syria in a, in a moment. We are going to need Russia there. Uh, we're going to need Russia in some of these other um, uh, multilateral issues, including, uh, including in North Korea. So I hope we can uh, kind of keep that door open to cooperation and um, keep some kind of ties to Russia, especially in areas where I think it is uh, very much in our, in our interest to do so. So I think uh, that's, uh, that's another uh, area where I think we need to uh, really be very careful that we don't uh, really take, in effect, dead aim at some of our most uh, important issues going on in the world as we try to find ways to pu punish Russia. Uh, finally, I think uh, it is crucial that today we kind of hold Ukraine close, that we do these things like credit guarantees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is probably not a good time for tough love with the Ukrainians, but I'll do it anyway, and which is to say, at some point, Ukraine needs to get a little serious. Um, they, are, they have been independent for some 23 years. They have one inept government followed by a corrupt government, and in Yanukovych's case, they had a twofer there, uh, quite inept and quite corrupt. Um, this is not acceptable when your neighbor is Russia. Uh, you can get away with this kind of thing if your neighbor is, say, Canada, but uh, their, neighbor, <laughs> their neighbor is not Canada. That was not an, I never talk about internal affairs, so, uh, but uh, I think Ukraine, in short, really needs to step it up and step it up seriously. You know, um, it is truly difficult to have a neighbor like Russia. And, uh, you know, Poland was very aware of that. And again, I do look to a lot of inspiration from the Poles, but, but uh, uh, you know, Poland, uh, you know, understood that. Poland developed civil society. If you look at the kind of people who emerged on the Polish scene in 89, Leszek Balcerowicz, uh, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, I mean, this was unbelievable, these people who emerged and, and uh, really, you know, answered the call of history. Um, it's as if Poland, uh, their experience in the 19th century uh, under Tsarist Russia taught them that they would have to keep schools going, keep a concept of, of, uh, of Polishness going. And so when the moment came in 1989, I think uh, by all accounts, and uh, uh, Poland was ready, I think um, Ukraine has, to put it mildly, not come close to that example. And yet I think uh, a lot of Ukrainian history is now going to unfold very rapidly in the future. And so they need to be ready for these, uh, for these challenges, and they need to start getting serious about economic reform. They need to start getting serious about uh, political reform. Um, I was frankly uh, pleased to see that when Timoshenko, one of the sort of oligarchs of, uh, 
of Ukraine, albeit a Ukrainian nationalist, came forward and said, pick me, uh, after, having, uh, after Yanukovych had her in, in prison. Uh, she got a kind of tepid response in Maidan, and uh, I think she went off to Germany for a while for convalescence. I think that was the right response to Timoshenko, if I can uh, sort of uh, engage in a little uh, internal or inside baseball in, in Ukraine. But uh, I think they need to look to a new generation of leadership that is going to be serious about the conflicts, the problems they face. Ukraine, frankly, um, has, is one of these countries, and there are others, but one of these countries that has really not looked at its own history, very honestly. And uh, I think uh, some of the, um, you know, Putin is not correct to dismiss all of the uh, Ukrainian nationalism or Ukrainian uh, uh, ambition for European Union. He's not right to dismiss that as a, uh, as a case of Ukrainians being uh, uh, some, uh, somehow a bunch of, uh, of, a bunch of uh, ultra-nationalists. I mean, the right sector, as it's called in Ukraine, is probably a 5% proposition. It's certainly not a uh, uh, much, much more than that. That said, I think Ukraine has a, uh, has a history that they have to be, if not honest with us, then maybe they ought to be honest with themselves. Um, you know, if you look at German uh, battle formations in World War II, the Wehrmacht, there are a lot of Ukrainian units. Uh, this falls below the level of inspiration for the rest of us, and I think the Ukrainians really need to, uh, need to uh, uh, step it up a little. Uh, we'll see how they manage uh, uh, events in the next weeks and months. I was very uh, pleased to read this morning that they have moved in on some of these uh, pro-Russian demonstrations in eastern Ukraine, recovered some of these uh, administrative buildings. That's going to be... Uh, uh, a process that they're going to have to engage in uh, with a certain amount of discipline that, frankly, they've, lo they've lacked in the past. So it's my uh, hope that Ukraine has kind of gotten the message, uh, but they have to, uh, as I said, they're going to have to step it up. So I think this is, a, this is going to be a, be a tough one. We're going to have to work with the Europeans on this. Uh, I think part of the issue is going to be long term. We're going to have to uh, step up sort of L LNG, uh, uh, you know, more uh, energy relationships with uh, Western Europe. That, that has been happening. It probably needs to be happening at a much uh, faster, faster rate. I think there is a, there's a hope that uh, we've been We've been warning the Europeans since 1978, and you can look it up, uh, that, uh, that they need to diversify their energy resources. I think there are some signs that they can do that, but uh, that is going to have to be something uh, important in the, in the years ahead. Um, I think this, our administration has done well to bring the world together. I mean, we even had a uh, UN General Assembly vote against the Russians. Uh, and so I understand why our, uh, our administration has been reluctant to uh, try to push for uh, more economic sanctions, because if you're uh, Germany, this is not welcome news. And I think you would start getting uh, some real problems in that uh, uh, solid alliance that we've had up until now. But uh, nonetheless, some of these longer term issues need to be addressed. So I think this is going to be, uh, this uh, crisis in Crimea is going to be with us for, uh, for a long time. Uh, CNN uh, may not have noticed that because they've been on all Malaysian airlines all the time. But, uh, but I think we're going to, uh, we're going to see this, crime, uh, this issue that was started in far away Crimea as one that is going to dominate the uh, uh, um, our thinking about East-West relations for some, uh, some years to come. Um, another issue that is looking more and more like a hardy perennial is the issue in Syria. Now, I know that uh, if you pick up a newspaper in this country, you think you've got a Darth Vader there in the form of Bashir al-Assad, and then you have a bunch of little Ewok villages uh, in the form of the opposition, and you sort of wonder, well, this is easy enough. Uh, I submit to you this one is very complex, and I also submit to you that our country misunderstood it uh, because uh, we didn't do the reading. And uh, I think it's uh, <laughs> it was very important to understand that um, you know 
The, the first question you should ask in these situations is not, uh, how do we get rid of that dictator? Uh, that's the second question, maybe. The first question is, how did that dictator get there in the first place? And I think if you ask that question first, you can start informing yourself on the second question, which is, you know, can we get rid of that dictator? And so when you look at, um, I think, what was going on in the Maghreb, there was a sort of, uh, you know, this sort of uh, galloping history in the form of the Arab Spring or the Arab Thing or whatever we're calling it today. Uh, and there was a sense, well, gee, we'll just, uh, you know, we're a little slow on Mubarak. Uh, and, uh, you know, after all, the world was calling for his removal and we weren't quite ready to do that. And so we're a little slow there. You know, gosh, we got criticized in the New York Times editorials, which is, you know, tough to sleep when that happens. And, and uh, um, so I think there was a feeling that maybe uh, the next crisis, we're going to be a little faster. And then in being faster, we'll look a little more prescient. We'll say, you know, he's got to go. Two weeks later, he goes. And, you know, oh, good thing we told him he has to go and he's gone. Um, I think there was a complete misunderstanding of what Syria is. Um, there's no question, by the way, I'll circle back to Mubarak for a second, there's no question that Mubarak had outlived his, uh, his shelf life. I think uh, people were quite tired of the, of the guy. But on the other hand, people who work with you for 30 years and, uh, you know, take bad guys off the street and, uh, you know, wrap them up in duct tape and deliver them to you. We had a little of that in Bosnia, too. Uh, you know, uh, he, he did a lot of good things for us. And uh, so I think it, it would have been unseemly for us to be the first to be demanding Mubarak's uh, uh, departure. I mean, I'm not saying he should have stayed, although I think some, some Egyptians are rethinking that. But certainly, uh, it was not for us to be the first. So in any event, we rushed out and said, uh, Bashir al-Assad must go. And I think the problem with that was uh, he wouldn't leave. And uh, <laughs> the reason he wouldn't leave is if you start, you know, uh, you know, just Wikipedia Syria, if nothing else, uh, uh, you can figure out that it's a pretty complicated place. There's a reason the Alawites are there. There's a reason the Druze, the Christians, the Kurds continue to support uh, Assad and the Alawites. And it has to do with their concerns about what the uh, what this Sunni majority would be if they re reached power. Now, I think there are, there are also a lot of Su Sunnis, by the way, who support uh, uh, Bas uh, Bashir al-Assad. So it wasn't at all clear that by shaming Assad and saying, you must go, that he was going to comply. Um, I think the hope was by saying, we'll never deal with that guy, is that we could somehow marginalize him. But I think we ended up marginalizing ourselves. We ended up in a situation where we could not talk to, uh, to Assad. We could not talk to anyone who thought that, that somehow Assad or even people around Assad could be uh, left standing after all this. And so we ended up uh, in a situation where the United States became not the mediators between uh, the, uh, the main uh, uh, parties into the conflict in Syria, we became mediators among the so-called Syrian op opposition. And so we had uh, diplomats, you know, inviting these uh, uh, disparate uh, uh, members of the so-called Syrian National Army, uh, of which there, I mean, there are like 10 Syrian National Armies. And so we'd invite him to the State Department, and I, I kid you not, they actually threw plastic water bottles at each other in a fifth floor conference room. So um, it was the United States, speaking of water bottles, I thought I had one here, but, uh, oh, over here, thank you. So um, I think the, the United States ended up, we ended up marginalizing ourselves through, uh, through this thing. The second thing we did, was to um, get behind a proposal by which the United uh, by which we would support provisional elections. Well, I think uh, being Americans, we all love elections. Uh, sometimes we love them more than others, but uh, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, we understand can't have a democracy without elections. Got it. 
I submit to you, you can have elections, though, without a democracy. And um, if you have a country in which there's no civil society, there are no functioning institutions, elections will do no more than simply provide you with a census. They'll tell you how many Sunnis there are, how many Shia, how many Kurds, etc. Because when there is weak governance, people often revert to previous forms of, of uh, association. And so to say we need provisional elections in Syria in the absence of any concept of what we're doing uh, looking forward is simply to say we need a census or, uh, in, in, uh, in Syria. And I can tell you what it is already. I can tell you how many Alawites there are, Kurds, et cetera. So what's the point of the elections? So I think we fail to understand some of the lessons we've learned over the years. And again, I don't want to uh, claim that uh, Bosnia was the uh, epitome of all that's good in the diplomatic world. But I'll tell you, um, people always say, well, Syria is just like Bosnia. It's very different in one very important respect. We sat with Russians, Brits, French, Germans, and we worked out something called a contact group plan. And what was important about the contact group plan was we identified what Bosnia would look like in the future. Now, some people don't like what Bosnia, what we decided Bosnia should look like in the future. Uh, but nonetheless, people started getting the picture. Bosnia would consist of two entities. There'd be a Serb Republic and a Croat uh, uh, Muslim or Croat Bosniak uh, Federation. Bosnia would have a collective presidency of uh, three, uh, three presidents who would take turns. Not my, necessarily my cup of tea, but at least if you're sitting in a foxhole in Bosnia, you started kind of getting what it was going to look like. Bosnia would be divided with 51% 50, of Bosnia under the, uh, the control of uh, the um, uh, Bosniak and Croat Federation, 49% under the, under the Serbs. We established right of return of refugees. In fact, when you look at, at what happened in, in the subsequent year when we negotiated in Dayton, Ohio, it was simply to elaborate and uh, implement the uh, contact group plan of the summer of 94 such that by the time um, 05 uh, rolled around and by the time we started, uh, we were prepared to go to Dayton to try to finalize this, everyone in every foxhole knew what it was gonna look like. And so no one ever wants to be the last person to die in a civil war. Very few monuments to the last person to die in a civil war. And so people essentially, even though we did uh, declare a, get a ceasefire declared, um, people were ready to stop fighting because they wanted to see the outcome in Dayton. I submit to you that we haven't done anything like that in, uh, in Syria, so nobody out there on the ground has any idea what Syria is really going to look like in the future. And it still seems like a winner-take-all situation. And so I think there's a lot to be uh, concerned about whether Syria is ever going to end. Um, there are those who say, well, you know, two years ago we could have solved it, can't solve it now. I think two years from now, people will say, well, two years ago we could have solved it, but we can't solve it now. I think with a little more diplomatic push and a little more diplomatic smarts, we could kind of identify what it is that Syria should look like in the future. Now there are those who say, well, how can the great powers solve this? Shouldn't this be up to the Syrians? Sorry, Syrians. When you have a war in which a couple of hundred thousand people have been killed, where poison gas, chemicals have been used against civilians, you don't necessarily get to dictate what, it's, what the international uh, community is going to think about your country or what it's going to come up with uh, about your country. And that was certainly the message to Bosnia. In fact, today you can read uh, where Bosnians are saying, you know, these international community, they came in, they set up these structures and these structures don't work. And I, and I would say to any Bosnian who makes that point to me, we didn't start the war, you did. You managed this uh, miserable process, so do not be surprised when the international community uh, comes in, and then do not be upset when the international community does not come up with precisely the solution that you would have liked to see, because once you have created this kind of havoc, uh, it, you, you are gonna have to live with the consequences. So I think we need to really step that up in, uh, in uh, Syria, 
And I think uh, we also, if we can't um, talk about, um, you know, if we can't foresee a, a Syria with Assad in the future, and frankly, I can't see how Assad could play a role in the future, you don't have to lead with that. I mean, just from a diplomatic point of view, you can kind of work on what the institutional sectarian arrangements might be, and once everyone kind of gets what the overall shape of the country is going to look like, then maybe you can say, of course, we don't think Bashir al-Assad is exactly uh, God's gift to, uh, to leading this place in the future, and then you can get to that. But this, I think, misplaced decision to, to go after Assad in the first place without any idea of what we're heading for, except for some kind of uh, Sunni stand in, uh, in Syria, I think was really, really a mistake. I might add that the reason I feel very... Uh, concerned about dealing with the Syrian situation is a point that I should have made earlier, which is left on its own, it's going to get worse, and it is already metastasized to other parts of the Middle East. That is, uh, already we've seen Islamic uh, um, uh, radical fighters in, in Iraq. I realize that there are people who think that somehow um, you know, Iraq's problems are caused by a difficult prime minister, a guy named Nouri al-Maliki. Uh, there is no question that Nouri al-Maliki is a difficult leader to deal with. He is no fun. If he ever had charisma, it cleared up a long time ago. I can <laughs> assure you of that. But uh, this is not about Iraqi domestic politics. This is about people who do not respect any notion of uh, of nation state borders. And uh, this is about Sunni on Sunni violence first and then Sunni on Shia violence second. So this is, uh, I think, if we do not get to the Syrian situation, we're going to see the Iraq situation deteriorate. We're already seeing it, uh, the situation deteriorate in, uh, in Lebanon, and frankly, I'm worried about Jordan. So I think um, uh, Syria qualifies as a, as a real crisis because it's not going to go away on its own, and it does touch a lot of interests of ours. Finally, and I'm kind of mindful of the time because I, I would like to have the opportunity to take a, a questions, um, we need to really be serious about these nuclear negotiations. I am um, very supportive of the basic six-month freeze that we got with, uh, with Iran, but needless to say, a six-month freeze with Iran is not going to take care of our problems there, even if it has bought some time for us. Uh, I think if Iran is allowed to go nuclear, if Iran is allowed to uh, uh, weaponize the uh, nuclear materials that, that it is making, it will make a complete mockery of the NPT if that hasn't already been done, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And uh, I think sooner or later this uh, Shia bomb will be followed by a Sunni bomb either in uh, uh, put together in some rogue uh, basis in, uh, in the Gulf states or even in Saudi Arabia. In short, I think uh, uh, Iran is a very uh, serious problem that requires, I think, our addressing diplomatically. And ultimately, if that fails, and ultimately, if nothing else works, I think we have to uh, defend what I believe to be na uh, vital national interests if Iran is allowed to get away with uh, creating a nuclear weapon. Because uh, if, they, if they do that, we will not be able to manage the problems of the Middle East. We will not be able to keep this issue from, um, from spreading. So um, for those who uh, think that somehow it was a mistake to uh, relax sanctions in, in Iran that we should have uh, simply poured on more sanctions. I understand the point of view, except I think everyone should stop and think in, uh, as to what their own personal reaction would be to sanctions. If someone sanctions me, I don't know about you, but if someone sanctions me, my reaction is not to say, oh my gosh, I better give in. I better do exactly what this person is asking me to do. That's certainly not my reaction. Uh, and, uh, I, I, and I think if I were an Iranian mullah, I would have the same sort of thing, where I just don't feel that this is, uh, uh, that um, I want to, uh, to give in. 
So people who say, well, sanctions brought Iran to the table, therefore they'll bring Iran to their knees, I think have to really think through the logic of that because I'm not sure it's really true, especially given that Iran has been heavily sanctioned and yet their nuclear program has gone forward um, despite these sanctions. So um, I think uh, we have used sanctions as an element in diplomacy and I think it's, uh, it's been well used, but I think it's time to see if we can cash in on the use of those sanctions to see if uh, we can get uh, the, those Iranians who are interested in a different course for their country, and I would include uh, University of Denver graduate uh, Javed Zarif, who's the Iranian nuclear uh, negotiator, I, I, would I would include him in the category of people in Iran who somehow want to show uh, the Iranians that uh, they can create a situation where Iran is more a part of the uh, a part of the Western world than certainly these mullahs have wanted to wanted Iran to be. So I think it's basically the right approach. But the question, of course, will be: Will it work? I think in any uh, nuclear in any negotiation, you can't put uh, you can't uh, front load all of what you've got to offer and hope that the other guy comes through with what you want. You have to do it on a kind of step by step basis. You have to do it in a way that if the, if the other country uh, somehow uh, reneges on what they've done, that you are in a position not to, not, uh, that you're in a position where you haven't given everything uh, away up front. So I think that's kind of where we are with, with Iran. Uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but I sure know that six months uh, is, uh, is uh, not an eternity. And in short, we'll know soon enough whether this is going to work. Uh, I think we need a lot of countries uh, to support this approach. We certainly need Iran's uh, neighbor, uh, Turkey, on board uh, with this. But I think we also need uh, uh, to have these kinds of secondary sets of conversations we've been having with the Iranians, that is namely the broader relationship, Iran's support for terrorism, Iran's support for Hezbollah, Iran's support for uh, getting in the Syrian uh, uh, civil war. I think we need to address all those in a separate set of negotiations, and I think we've been doing that, and I think that's really the right approach. So I give the administration pretty good uh, marks on Iran, and uh, I think we will know sooner enough, soon enough, what the issue, you know, how this, uh, whether Iran is interested in this deal or not, and uh, I think uh, uh, the one argument that somehow when you when you relax sanctions, they're hard to tighten again. I appreciate that argument, but I don't think they're impossible to tighten again. And so I think if Iran is seen as completely turning its back on this, I think we will be able to ratchet that up. But with the understanding that that hasn't worked up until now to dissuade them from their nuclear programs. And so we may have to uh, look further down the list. Um, finally, I think uh, uh, North Korea, uh, you know, we see more and more signs that uh, North Korea has, uh, if it ever had an interest in uh, nuclear uh, disarmament, certainly isn't displaying any of those interests today. I think it's especially important at this point to understand that there's, I think, limits to what we can do with the, uh, with the North Koreans and uh, directly, and that really, at the end of the day, our issue with North Korea is really going to be a question of the quality of our relationship with China and whether we can uh, establish the kind of patterns of cooperation we need to establish uh, with China. I think this is an especially important time to work uh, as closely as possible with China. First of all, I think pushing uh, uh, Putin, as I think we have to do, kind of opens up the possibility that Russia and China will have a closer relationship. After all, it was uh, in February 1972, the Shanghai Accords, when we essentially broke the Sino-Soviet access. I think you can make a good argument for saying that uh, uh, when uh, the Shanghai Accords were signed, it was not about a U.S.-China alliance. It was about the breaking up of this uh, Sino-Soviet relationship, such that I don't think the Soviet Union ever recovered. And I think if historians trace the Cold War, the, the end of the Cold War, they can go back to, uh, to Shanghai and see how it began with Henry Kissinger and uh, Richard Nixon then. But I think the, uh, as, uh, 
we need to really be alert to Russia, Chinese uh, uh, rapprochement. I don't think the Chinese look at the world the same way uh, Vladimir Putin does, but I think we need to be aware of that, uh, of uh, what is happening in that relationship. Secondly, I think we need to get a lot smarter and a lot more aware of what's going on internally in China, and it is not a pretty sight. We have a uh, Chinese leadership that I think is increasingly uh, um, facing, I think, uh, you know, deep concerns within the society about the efficacy of this kind of communist governance uh, together with a kind of go-go uh, economy. And so I think there are a lot of people in China who are very unhappy with the government. And this uh, unhappiness spills out uh, in different forms. Certainly there are many Chinese who feel that uh, uh, China has to do a better job on human rights, and certainly if you look at the blogosphere in China, you see a lot of human rights stuff there. But if you look carefully at the blogosphere of China, you see a, lo a lot of other things going on, namely heightened nationalism in China. I think to some extent it's uh, instrumental. It's to say that uh, coming from people, uh, people pushing the uh, the party government apparatus, it's to say, hey, you call yourselves so tough, you say you are there to protect us from another century of shame, why are you allowing the Vietnamese to get away with this in the South China Sea? So ironically, some of the critics that the party state structures of China are facing are coming at them from a more nationalistic uh, uh, basis. So this is not easy uh, to, to manage these uh, these issues. And I think if you're uh, Xi Jinping and you, uh, you know, wake up in the morning and, you know, look at your inbox, uh, you're maybe not thinking that uh, North Korea should be at the top of the inbox. You're thinking about these other, I think, much more uh, uh, homegrown and more serious uh, issues for, uh, for China. To be sure, I think there are a lot of people in China, uh, especially in the party, especially in the uh, PLA, the, uh, the uh, uh, People's Liberation Army, who consider um, somehow, uh, who have a kind of zero-sum thinking, you know, they don't look in terms of uh, in terms of win-win uh, uh, for them as some kind of, I don't know, Burmese uh, politician, but uh, uh, they look at it more in terms of zero sum. And uh, I think many of them see if North Korea goes down, and ironically, it's the Chinese who feel that if we really push the North Koreans, that somehow North Korea could, could collapse, and they would see that as a victory for America and a defeat uh, for China. So uh, we need to convince them that uh, South Korea would be a very good neighbor uh, to China. I think they got an inkling of that when uh, the South Korean president some 10 months ago, uh, Park Geun-hye, went to China. And, uh, but it almost kind of backfired on the Chinese leadership because a lot of Chinese people, again, through this blogosphere, were saying, why can't we have one of those? Uh, because uh, I think there's a real deep, uh, uh, on real, I mean, a deep, deep sense of, uh, of uh, disquiet, really, about the uh, Chinese leadership and whether this party structure is really up to the task. So China's facing a lot of issues, and so, dare I say it, uh, while we, uh, we probably have to be more patient as we ask the Chinese to be less patient on, uh, on North Korea, but we also need to understand that if we don't have China with us on this North Korea issue, we're not going to, uh, going to solve it. I think it's been significant that as they invited Park Geun-hye uh, to China last year, the South Korean president, they've never invited uh, Kim Jong-un to, uh, uh, to China. And so clearly the Chinese are unhappy with the course of events in uh, in North Korea, uh, Chung Song Tech's demise. I mean, I wouldn't call him a reformer. I don't think there are too many people in uh, North Korea who fit that uh, description, certainly not Chung Song Tech, but uh, he may have been a sort of black marketeer, but I think the Chinese felt he was their black marketeer, and uh, therefore uh, they are very unhappy with uh, uh, the um, uh, 
Kim Jong-un uh, essentially arresting him and then perp walking him out of a party meeting and then shooting him. Uh, I think the uh, Chinese are very unhappy with that, but they're really not sure what to do about it. So I think that's another area where the, the key to North Korea may be in a sort of uh, carom shot, that is, uh, to mix the metaphor, that is, we need to really work with the Chinese uh, and develop better patterns of relationships. You know, there's a lot of discussion in this country uh, that somehow we're in this mess because we have a president who's not tough enough. Uh, I submit to you the real problem is we have a president who's not close enough to a lot of these people, is a bit of a distant figure, does not have the kinds of relationships that I think we need with some of these uh, leaders. Now, not that uh, having a close relationship with Vladimir Putin is going to solve the problem of, uh, of Crimea, uh, but I think the problem is we are seen as kind of distant, um, partially because our president is not a sort of up close and personal person, but I think we're also be increasingly seen as distant because there's a sense that the United States has kind of had it with all this and we're kind of withdrawing, pulling back from the world. And uh, certainly if you live in Colorado as I do and you see the problem of uh, Pueblo County not being able to get money for uh, school roofs, uh, you can understand why, why people in Pueblo County are maybe not so thrilled about sending their tax money off to places like Afghanistan. So I think uh, a lot of, um, the, uh, as we get f uh, ready to uh, you know, manage this, uh, this tranche of issues, and they will be with us for some time, we need to develop, I think, a better consensus of what our country needs to do in the world. And I think we need to develop a more systematized, uh, uh, active approach to these, uh, uh, to these issues. You know, I don't know why uh, people in our country are so uh, kind of at odds with each other. Uh, you get the sense that people don't really communicate uh, very well with each other. They don't have a uh, decent respect for the opinions of others. Uh, I think we could do a lot better. I tend to blame internet shopping for all this. Uh, um, you know, um, frankly, if you buy a book uh, and then after you've bought, clicked on the book and it says, hey, if you like that stupid book, we've got five more stupid books, uh, you know, which are just like the one you just bought. So uh, really, I would like to open up a website that says, you know, if you're going to read that, you better read this because this will give another vantage point and another uh, approach to the issue. Uh, I think too often we have becoming, uh, we're becoming increasingly compartmentalized with people that we agree with. It happens all, all through things, you know. I used to follow baseball by following, uh, you know, wherever I was, I'd read about, you know, I might have to suffer through reading about the Cardinals or something, but I knew something about the re rest of the league or the uh, MLB, and now I just read about the Red Sox because I can go right to redsox.com without knowing anything about what the other teams are doing. In short, I think the internet, which is supposed to make uh, news and uh, uh, universal, has actually had the perverse effect of kind of compartmentalizing us and having us only read stuff that we're kind of inclined to uh, read in the first place. So I would encourage you uh, next time you order a book and they suggest five similar books, ask them for five opposite books to choose from. So um, anyway, where did I learn those enlightened thoughts from the Naval War College? And uh, uh, so for those of you who are here, uh, congratulations. For those of you who are getting perfect grades, Congratulations, and for those of you who are not, maybe you too can become ambassador. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, let me tell you, uh, it, uh, my time at the Naval War College really helped me steer the rest of my career, and it wasn't uh, a week that went by when uh, something, uh, usually from s and P, I I must say, uh, didn't come up where I realized uh, where I learned to think or where I learned to uh, uh, point my boat. So thank you very much, and we'll do some questions. So how should I do this? Just.
You know, I was once in, in the audience when we had a CNN reporter named Peter Arnett come and speak. I think he was a New Zealander or something. And he was a, a Gulf War um, uh, uh, reporter. And he, uh, this guy from New Zealand gets up. I mean, I love New Zealand, don't get me wrong. And uh, he started talking about some botched military operation. And the first question was, Sir, what would you know about a botched military operation from a successful military operation? So anyway, we'll see if there's st <laughs> yeah. So, yes, sir. Hi, sir. Um, um, thanks a lot for being here tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm Army, Army Colonel Paul Riley. I've got a question about Russia, and I'd like to take you back to your S&P days and uh, Thucydides, and, and why he believed that states um, would go to war with each other, and that was honor, fear, and interest. And so thinking about uh, a couple months back, or a month back, when um, we started seeing Russia moving into Crimea, um, I tried to think about our interests at the time, and I tried to decide whether we should use military force, or whether we would use military force, or how we would use military force in such an instance. And in my mind, we didn't, this didn't rise to an interest in which we would be deploying military forces to somehow counter this. But then as the time went on, um, I asked myself, well, what happens if um, Putin goes into eastern Ukraine? What if he goes into Transnistria and Moldova? Um, at what point does this trigger our honor or our fear, or at what point does it actually become an interest? I suppose our NATO relationship would trigger an interest, but at what point does a military move into eastern Ukraine or into Moldova that isn't directly affecting a NATO ally, at what point does that cause us to um, deploy military forces in some manner? And. Um, and that's basically the, essen the yeah. essence of the question. I think it's a very important uh, question and phrased another way, you know, what are the tripwires here? And, uh, you know, I think it's very difficult to talk about our country going to war over Transnistria. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very difficult to talk about our country going to war over eastern uh, Ukraine. Um, but I don't think it's difficult to talk about a real stepped up effort with the eastern flank of NATO and a, uh, an understanding that uh, should those things happen, we are into, I think, a long term uh, competition with, with uh, Russia. And I think we need to be very much more present on the eastern flank of, uh, of NATO. Um, I, Again, I, I, you know, if we get to that point where the Russians are essentially, uh, you know, taking over the equivalent of the Sudetenland or something, I mean, we have a very serious problem that requires a serious response. Uh, I am not of the view, however, that we can uh, sell the American people on the idea that we need to be uh, uh, militarily, or that we need to declare war on Russia. I am of the view, though, that we need to really reorder our priorities and uh, make it understood to our people generally. But uh, uh, I would say we need to be, you know, step up our, capa our capabilities to deal with this. I, um, my view is that um, uh, Putin has done this out of fear, if you will, but fear in the sense that I think he has, uh, Russia has some of the, uh, the dysfunctions that uh, I described in uh, Ukraine. Uh, I, you know, Russia has never been able to diversify its economy beyond hydrocarbons. Uh, it's not at all clear that, uh, you know, when Russia, 85% of their exports are hydrocarbons, I think Russia is in some economic uh, uh, distress at this point. And I think, at that, and I think um, we are going to have to kind of uh, be prepared for a long-term uh, competition, which we will prevail. Uh, but we will prevail insofar as we, uh, I think, uh, keep our allies 
uh, very much uh, close and, and with us, and I think we're doing that. And I would simply like to see a, um, a, uh, a return to more bipartisan forms of uh, foreign policy. I'm a little too naive, uh, I'm not naive enough to say that uh, politics stops at the water's edge, but I think we do need to uh, kind of uh, develop some national consensus on what we do about Russia. And just because you got a CNN camera on you doesn't entitle to you to say anything in the world you want to say. And I think some of our uh, uh, politicians from the legislative branch, I'd like to see a little more uh, support uh, during this, uh, for the administration during this time. You know, you're, uh, you can certainly uh, vote them out of office as soon as you want, but uh, uh, we need to do a much better job of not, of, uh, not sounding weak and divided, but uh, strong and united, and I, I think we can, uh, we can do that. So. Yes. Hey, good evening, Ambassador. Thanks for coming by, sir. My name is Lieutenant Commander Suggs from the intermediate class here at the War College. Sir, my question is to, to ask you to get to, about a sense of some of the diplomatic uh, leadership uh, and senior officials' uh, thoughts and opinions on, on this very uh, difficult and, and uh, uncertain age that we seem to be going in, not, not a lot different than how you described your experiences at the War College in, after the Cold War. Well, I think the American people do need to, uh, if not be re-enthused, but perhaps better informed about why these issues are important and why we cannot be indifferent to them and why we cannot turn our backs on them. Uh, I think it would be helpful, though, if our country could do a little better job, or I should say, uh, inside Route 495, otherwise known as the Beltway, uh, there can be a little better effort at consensus on why these issues are important. I must say, uh, I was uh, when when uh, Assad's forces used chemical weapons against uh, civilians. My reaction was, uh, those forces that did that, we ought to just hit them, and hit them hard. Uh, I I didn't feel we should go to you know, some kind of, you know, ask permission of Congress or, you know, go anywhere. I just felt when you use a banned weapon, uh, you should pay for it. Uh, and so I, I expressed that view, and I was quite surprised by uh, the reaction of people around me in Colorado uh, who very much opposed that idea. So uh, it's not to say that people who don't agree with me are uninformed, uh, and I'm you know, but uh, I really feel we can make the case better uh, than we've been doing. And I think the trouble is every single issue um, uh, gets thrown into this mosh pit of politics in our country. And I think there's this excessive politicization of everything right now. I'm not saying that everything was great in the late 30s when you had people you know, in the FDR administration who wanted to be more active and yet the rest of the country didn't. I'm not saying these are unprecedented issues, but the shrillness, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the attacks, the vituperousness of these uh, kind of internal, um, of our internal dialogue, I think is a lot worse. Um, you know, certainly it's 24-hour news cycles, it's a lot of things, but uh, we need to do, I think, a much better job of uh, informing our people of this. You know, again, and going back to the use of chemical weapons, I mean, I just never thought I'd see, uh, you know, the use of chemical weapons against uh, civilians in an urban area, and then no one does anything about it. I, and that's kind of what, what happened. I, I think the ultimate 
resolution where I think we've been able to get these chemical weapons uh, removed and you know there, there has been progress on that I think it was a good idea but uh, uh, I, I just don't think people should get away with that kind of stuff in this world and so I was kind of disappointed in the reaction yes sir ambassador uh I'm in trouble now, but okay. <laughs> sort of riff on your idea of the political interference in the process. Uh, today we were given the chance of respectful seeing Senator Leahy berating the administrator of USAID over the so-called Cuban Twitter. Are you familiar with this, sir? Uh, no. Uh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Computer programs yeah. similar to Twitter to yeah. allow uh, those who were working yeah. to foment democracy in Cuba to communicate among yeah. themselves. And I'm, as a public affairs officer myself, public affairs yeah. foreign service officer, I see that idea as, in fact, a very creative way to use soft power. And I, I found myself very baffled that it is engendering the kind of negative reaction inside our own country that it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, some of this public diplomacy stuff, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little worried about, you know, if the 20th century gave us Atchison, Kissinger, and, uh, you know, Holbrook, and the 21st century gives us Twitter accounts, I, 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 I get a little worried about this. I think a lot of uh, diplomacy is, by definition, something that ought to be in more traditional uh, channels. I also, um, look, I would like to see that regime in Cuba ended a long time ago. Um, but I worry, and I, I don't know what uh, Senator Leahy said about this, but I do worry that sometimes um, it seems that we are, uh, you know, using what are perceived as sort of old fashioned propaganda uh, tools or propaganda uh, approaches through new tools. And so I guess um, what, I'm, uh, what I worry about sometimes is, um, you know, we have all these programs for public media. I know, you know, I know Alec Ross. I know all these guys who've been working on this. I get, um, I, I get a little worried whether um, um, they are done without a sense of uh, priorities of what we really need to do to safeguard our national interests. And so, you know, I don't know the details of what AID was doing there, uh, and it may have been quite, um, you know, quite okay. I don't know. I mean, I certainly would like to help civil society in Cuba, don't get me wrong, but I, I, I just think we need to be a little careful how we proceed in some of these things. I, 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 uh, you know, I'm all in favor, you know, when, when the issue is human rights, I think we need to be speak up and speak clearly. But I think sometimes, you know, when we start telling countries how to organize everything in their country from their parliament to their baseball leagues, I think we need to be a little more careful on that. And the reason is, I think, uh, uh, you know, we, as much as we are maybe helping civil society in one country, a lot of countries are saying, what are they doing now? Next time they'll come after us. And so I, I just, I just want to make sure there's been some prioritization of these issues as we go forward on them. And uh, Lord knows we need to do a much better job of public uh, uh, diplomacy, of explaining to countries what we're doing. But uh, I get worried when there's an, you know, uh, a sense that somehow we're using this as means to uh, topple governments that we don't like. Not a, uh, there'll be a quiz tomorrow, you know. Uh, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Charlie, thank you, Mayor Alex. Could you talk a little bit about China and the, their claims inside the First Island chain and how yeah. we counteract those if we can? Yeah, I think we've kind of done okay on that. I think these are not new claims by China. The, the newness of it is their efforts to enforce it. 
and to enforce these claims. I was in the Philippines a few weeks ago, and I was very struck by the fact that many Filipinos are referring to the Chinese as bullies. I heard that word a lot in reference to the Chinese claims. Um, I was very uh, uh, struck by, you know, people used to talk about what a, you know, foreign pol what a, a soft power juggernaut China was, and you know, uh, their leaders would go and listen and spend. Uh, you know, uh, three days in a country while our leaders spend, you know, three hours in a country. But uh, I was very struck in uh, visiting uh, Southeast Asia, how many enemies China's made through this. Um, again, I think it, it has to do with internal dynamics in China. It has to do with the, uh, with the fact that uh, 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 use of these new technologies uh, these uh, sort of microblogging type stuff that's going on in China, big time, is basically people are upset with the government, but how do they come at the government? And they kind of outflank them on the nationalist uh, issue. Uh, and I think the Chinese have handled it very poorly because they try to react to it by saying, what do you mean we're not being tough? And so uh, I think the problem is that when Xi Jinping gets up and looks at that big in, uh, inbox, you know, Philippine public opinion is not the first issue that he cares about. Uh, so um, I think China is kind of causing a lot of problems for itself. Uh, I don't think these problems are necessarily new. And I think to understand China's relations with neighbors, they have a different historical patrimony. I mean, I think the relations with neighbors in Chinese past is, is relations with tributary states. And uh, that's why I'm a strong believer is if you want to understand uh, what's going on in the world today, you ought to study some history. I mean, I must say all the history I studied is now political science. Uh, and frankly, all the political science I studied, you know, like uh, Russian agriculture you know, or, you know, uh, policy, that's all history. Uh, but uh, I think people need to have a little better appreciation for how China has operated in past centuries. And my point there and my point is a lot in a lot of things is things change more slowly than you think. And uh, I think uh, a country like, like China has to overcome a legacy of many centuries, not just a legacy of the last few decades. When I look at the way China has a tendency, Beijing, for example, when their missile launcher shows up in North Korea, uh, I have no doubt that very few people knew about that in China, in Beijing. But uh, for centuries, Beijing, you know, there's always been this struggle between center and periphery. And the center always tries to pretend that they're really running everything. Uh, and so I think they continue to do that to this day and say, oh, yes, we planned exactly that. But I don't think they have. So I think uh, uh, there is a big future for people who want to learn Chinese and understand what is going on in that country because it is really, uh, I think, going to be with us for a long time. And by the way, for people who think that this is all about, you know, that somehow we ought to, uh, or to use the Thucydides, that somehow uh, war is inevitable between the uh, rising power and the established power, you know, fly to Beijing, take a cab 45 minutes north from Beijing and, and have a look at that Great Wall and ask yourself, do you really want to get into a fight with the people who built a thing like that? So, thank you very much. All right.